Hey, I know that it's the first weekend for the NFL, but my Lions won already, so it doesn't matter. So we'll be here for hours. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But man, the Lions are in first place, first time in 60-some years. It's, it's a good year already. But man, we started a series called The Remnant, and last week we started it with Noah, and we're just diving in. Last week we really locked into Noah to see that God can use the few. See, he used Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives to restart and to go through this and begin over. And again, today, we're going to dive in to learn about Elijah. And I think it's cool because we see how God can use the ordinary. See, we don't get much about Elijah in the beginning. See, he's a prophet, and his life goes on to be incredible in serving and doing what he needs for the Lord. But in the beginning, he's just there to combat Baal worship and truly try to get Israel back into worshiping the God of Israel, the true God. So as we start, we're going to be in 1 Kings. In 17.1, it says, Now Elijah, who was from Tisbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. See, Ahab was the king, and he was one of the worst kings and e most evil king they had. And he was doing all this worship to Baal, and he should have followed in the footsteps of the kings that were following from David and Solomon, following the Lord. So, again, this is the beginning of Elijah. We hear he, where he was from, and then he stood up to, got to the king and was bold. And I love that. See, we have to be bold, and we have to understand who we serve, and that's what it said. It said, Elijah, he lived to share the God of Israel and the God that he served. See, we let go of ourselves when we're believers, and we understand who Christ is. That's the whole key. That's how we get through. That's how we understand the narrow road. We die to self, and we're new. See, it doesn't matter where you were. It doesn't matter what you've done. God loves us enough to send his son. So we let go of us. And we say, man, I am new. I want to keep growing. So we're going to keep learning. And we're going to see how God can use ordinary people like we are. If you're extraordinary, then please come see me. But I need to, to, to learn from you some more. But man, we're ordinary. God has created us all to do and be a part of the body. See, at Christ Church, he is the head. We are the body. We're all needed. We're all used by God to make a difference. So it goes on in 1 Kings 17 and verse 2. It says, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by Kareth Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River, and drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. And I want to share that because, see, King Ahab was so bad, he goes and serves God and tells this king that he's doing wrong. There's going to be no rain. And King Ahab wants to kill him then. See, and God tells him, go hide and run here and I will take care of you. I love it. The creator of heaven and earth tells him, the ravens will feed you and the ravens do. How big is your God? Mine's huge. See, he'll take care of us in any means he can when we sincerely seek him and we desire to learn and to serve him and to let go of ourselves. See, as Elijah had to trust in the Lord, we do as well. There's times we don't understand. There's things that happen that we are confused about sometimes, but that's what trust in the Lord is is for. That's what faith is for. It moves us to do and to live even when we don't understand. And he did. He went down to the brook and he drank from the brook and he ate what the ravens brought him. Sadly, who knows what they brought him. I saw, this is no, no lie, a couple weeks ago, I was in here practicing and in that window, a bird hit the window and then one of those big black crow raveny things 
grabbed that bird out of midair and beat him up on that rock and ate him. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's strange. But again, God had the raven bring him food. Could have been chicken, who knows? I'm sure it tasted like chicken, no matter what it was. But see, we have to understand that God will. God sent his son when we weren't deserving. He will take care of us. He has taken care of us for eternity because through Christ we have eternal life. How cool is that? See, it's not how good we are. It's not what we can do. It's when we let go and let the Spirit lead us. And we believe that Jesus is the only way. See, we say God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. That's real. We can't just say it when we're going through good, and he's good. When we're bad, then something's wrong, and God is the same. We have to remember that he is good all the time. It's real, and we trust him, and we do, and we learn, and we grow together to understand what we can do and how we can be a light. See, the brook where he was getting his water dries up. There's no rain for three years or more. So God sends him somewhere else. See, our circumstances might change. The things we go through might change. The struggles we have might change, but our God does not change. He will always be there to help us through any situation. So, Elijah gets up and follows God to the next thing. Look at in 1 Kings 17, 8. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. He finds her and he shares that she has, and she shares, she only has a remnant of food left for her and her son. And Elijah, knowing what God can do and knowing that he set this up, already shares this in 1 Kings 17. We get, but Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. Always. See, she had nothing left, she thought, just enough. And she followed God and made it for Elijah first. And then they never needed flour or oil again until the rains and the crops grew. See, that's why it's so important that as the family, the body of Christ, we come together and we learn and we're there for each other. No one is needing to be in need. We have this family connection. We have relationships building. When one is struggling, one is not. We can come together and help in every way possible. We have things that happen daily. Make a connection. Don't go through it alone. Know that God is there. See, when we know God is real and he cares for us, we start to do the things that please him. When we're just going through life and maybe, eh, whatever, I'll pick him, I won't pick him, I'll do whatever. Again, there is that wonder and fear that creeps in. God is real and he's good all the time. And we can listen and trust and have faith no matter what. And that's what I love what Paul shares. My favorite verse is Philippians 1.21. It's, for me, living means living for Christ and dying is gain. Dying is gain. We don't think that. But if you're for Christ, it's gain. And we can go through living life for Christ. So again, when we hear something we might not understand, but Christ, we trust in the word of God. It is the truth. It is the way. It is Christ who became flesh that is the word from the beginning. He was with God. He was God. And he came to us in flesh. See, we can believe this and we can do this and we can live it out. 
by diving in and saying, God, I'm going to study. I'm going to study not just to know it so I can share with people and show how smart I am. I'm going to study for the wisdom I can get to live it out, to die to myself, to be different than this world, to be able to understand that the world is not my friend. Christ is my Lord and Savior. See, when we understand he's real, we really become second. See, he becomes first. See, he's not in the passenger seat with us. He's driving when we truly get it. And say, see, we start doing things that will please him and we make a difference. I want to share this story. I accepted Christ in 2005. I was a teacher. I coached high school football. I coached college football. I coached every sport you can think of. I coached basketball, volleyball, tennis. And I was brand new in my faith. I was coaching tennis at Sunrise Mountain High School. And they had this big tournament every year. And I took my six kids that I had, the boys, in the tennis. And we go to this big tennis facility in, in Glendale area. And I get there, and there's almost every team in the high school back then. There's a lot more high school teams now. But there was all the teams there for a regional tournament. And the guy that runs the tournament owns the facility. And he goes, listen, I have some matches at the high school down the road. And I have some matches here. So I look at the schedule, and I have six kids, no assistant coach. And I have a kid playing at 10 o'clock at the high school and a kid playing at 10, 15 at the facility. So all the coaches are there going through it, and I go, whoa, I can't do this. He's like, we've done this for 15, 20 years. This is the schedule. I go, I can't send my kid to a different school if I can't be there with them. I'm the only coach. Their parents have given their kids to me for protection and safety. I cannot do that. He goes, what are you going to do? I said, I will take all six of my kids at 10 o'clock and we'll play there. And then we'll take all six of my kids when that match is done and we'll come play the other match. He goes, that will mess up the tournament hours. I said, well, you should have thought of that. But see, this is what I believe because again, I, I'm, I'm under the care of your, or these children that I have or these kids. And again, we can choose and they were angry and they weren't excited about it. But we waited and we did it. And again, they were angry and they were all, shh. And it's, we got to be okay with it. See, when we understand, like Elijah did, go tell this king, go share this. You serve me, I'm with you, we can do difference. And I love it because I had a couple coaches came up to me and said, man, thank you. We've been trying to do this for years, but we just didn't want to change it. I was like, man, when you let go and let God, you'll do things when you think you can't, and he will lift you up to do the right thing. Now, do you believe he's real? Then you'll do it. If he's just a patch you need when you need him, you won't do anything for him. See, your life will still be for you. See, we will have the reverent fear that leads to wisdom, and we will choose right living. All you have to do is please God. You don't have to please this world. If you do what God wants you to do, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant, it doesn't matter who's angry with you here. Again, you should not care. You should be growing every day. And it's getting tougher and tougher because we're here at this timing, and they're trying everything they can to shut down our beliefs and shut down our Christian values. Look at this quote from John Bevere. I'm reading a book called The Awe of God. He says, to fear God is to esteem, respect, honor, venerate, and adore him above anyone or anything else. That's good right there. But look what it goes on to say. It says, when we fear God, we take on his heart. We love what he loves and we hate what he hates. Notice, it is not to dislike what he hates, Rather, it's to hate what he hates. What is important to him becomes important to us. What is not important to him becomes not so important to us. 
See, when we fear God in a reverent way, we start to think, will this please God? Before we think, will it feel good to us? We can say no to this world. See, 1 Kings goes on in 17 and 15, it says, so she, she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continue to eat for many days. See, the fear that was creeping in her, I have no more food, I don't know, to, all right, you say it, and God, it came from God, I will do it, and they were taken care of. See, as life happens, things in this world change. We should be grateful we have a God that does not change. We talk about it all the time. Don't listen to progressive Christianity. Christianity does not change. Christianity is Christ-like. It's being like Jesus, who is the same. He doesn't change to fit into the world. He stands above to fit in to what God did. He died because he did what God wanted him to do. God in flesh, he says, if you can take this cup, I'm good with that, but not my will be done, yours. That's all we need to do. Die to self and say, God, I need your will. I know it's the only way. See, even in the hard times, we should thank God and live for him. Because our free gift, listen, our free gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's free, but you have to accept it and use it. We have, it's the easiest thing to see. If someone gives you something free and you never use it, it's not a gift. You have to live for Christ. Not for you and then patch on whatever you want. What I need them now, it's living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's real and we get to have it. And we should desire, we should be cheerful every single day. Because look at, I love this. This is one of the coolest stories in the Bible. We see Elijah's done hiding and he's, the rain's, he's praying for the rain to come back. And now he is going back. And he says to King Ahab, I love this. He says in 1 Kings 18, 18 and 19, I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers. For you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of the image of Baal instead. Now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who are supported by Jezebel. See, he goes, okay, king, let's do this. You bring your 850. See, Elijah thought he was the only prophet left. And he's bold. You ever been on that? Your own, you're on your own, and there's everyone around you is worldly, and you're it. Can you stand up? Man, you got to stand up because God is with you. See, he thought he was the only one. That's why I love it here, Christ Church. It's a place to call home. You always have someone here that has your back, that will support you, that will help you, that will be with you. But I love this. See, our mentality, our mentality for us living should be the same. Christ is everything. And we live and we understand and we believe that he has us. See, Elijah, thinking he was the only one, didn't stop him. He still brought this king and said, bring all of Israel to see what's going to happen and it goes on in Kings 18, 22. It says, then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls. The prophet of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of the altar, but without setting fire to it. Then call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord the God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. See, that's bold. He still needed to be courageous. 
See, that's what comes together. See, courageous means we're going to do. So we link it together, and now we're walking with confidence because we're studying the Word of God daily, not just on Sunday. See, we challenge you every day to get in this, and we read it every day because I need to. Because I need to remember all the stuff that God has poured into me and how he, I can be different, and I need it because the attacks of the world will come. So I'm going to keep studying this and keep thanking God no matter what happens. And we keep pushing through. Be bold. Be courageous. See, when we follow Christ today, sometimes we'll be the minority. In most places, we'll be the minority. That's when we step up and we share that Christ is real and Christ is our Lord and Savior and we share boldly and we start to shine his light, not ours. See, we become less and less. He becomes more and more. See, this world is trying to take over every aspect of our lives. See, the news only shares what they need to. Schools are pushing things that undermine parents and teach sin to be okayed. See, they're using fear to control us in every single way. We don't need to fear. We have the ultimate. We have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's nothing to fear here. We just keep pushing through. See, we can be bold to speak out with his wisdom and then have the courage even when it might not be popular. See, the prophets of Baal went first with no success. Look at this story. King, 1 Kings 18, 27 goes, About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming or relieving himself. Or maybe he's away on a trip. Or he's asleep or needs to be awakened. See, their God that they worship with 450 of these prophets did nothing because he is nothing. I love it. Have that boldness. Have that courageous power in you because the Holy Spirit lives in you. We say this every week almost. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today's the day. Come see us. We're here after church. We stick around. We want to talk to you. My wife is here. Kaylee is here. Trace is here. I am here. Let's start this journey because it's the best journey you'll ever choose. And then you'll be able to live and start growing and be bold and have a power and a joy that the world cannot give. See, there is no peace of heart and mind in the world. Well, how do you know that? Because the Bible says it. In John Jesus says it. I offer you a gift, a peace of heart and mind that the world cannot give. See, money won't do it. Pleasures won't do it. Opening up to whatever sexual immorality you want or greediness you want or whatever you think you can get, it won't do it. They're struggling all the time until you release. You say, I want peace and joy and I want my mind to be renewed every day into you, and we do it. See, the story shows that no matter what they did, Baal was nothing but an idol. We get caught up with many useless idols as well. What useless idol is present in your life? Let it go. Phones, TV, food, money, football. See, they all make us dumbed to the world. And again, I love it. I'm going to go home and watch some football. And the cool thing about it is, truly, I will fall asleep in the second half of the first game and wake up in the second half of the second game. So I really get the beginning and the end of something. But again, it doesn't control me anymore, and it used to. I coached football, college, and high school, and that's all I did nonstop for 12 or six months of the year. And I had a 
say, God. And people ask me, when I accepted Christ, I left everything in my past. I left teaching. 18 years of teaching, I just stopped it. I didn't even tell my wife. I, re- I resigned and became a pastor. I came home from um, summer break, and I, I just left teaching, and I, I was, it was so amazing. My non-Christ-following principal, school was starting in two weeks, and I came to him and said, hey, I have a chance to go full-time ministry. Can I get out of my contract? He said, I'll do one better. If you don't like ministry, I'll give you your job back. No one gives up PE jobs. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I didn't have to grade a lot of papers. <laughs> I got to play a lot of sports. I could pump up any ball at whatever <laughs> weight they needed to be, air pressure wise. No one gave that up. Summer's off. See, I just dropped it because God called me to ministry and I knew it was a calling, so I could not even care. You know, and people tell me, but what about your retirement? See, God will take care of us. See, he'll have the ravens feed me something. (laughs) And we keep pushing on, and we keep growing, and we keep learning, and we keep growing, and we keep learning. See, don't let a useless idol. Again, none of those things are bad. It's when you have to. Could you imagine if the things we think we have to do was diving in and studying God's word? Because usually when I tell people to read God's word, oh, I hate reading. Really, it's, it's, it's God. It's Jesus. He's going to give you. And again, I shared that I knew any sport, any sport except soccer, sorry, I would do at any time of the day. So when I accepted Christ, I got up every day at five o'clock and started praying and reading the Bible. 19 years, now I get up on vacation, I get up at 5.15 and I read the Bible. And I believe, please believe me, I do not like to read. But I said, if I can do it for something that I loved, then I have to love God enough to do it for him every day. And that's what God has done For me, I'm not perfect. I mess up. I have to repent. I have to ask God to help me every day. But he is my number one. We have to understand that. We can all be there. We can all keep growing. We can all be used because he wants us all as the body of Christ doing the things we need to help others. See, the Bible is vital for us to see truth and what it looks like when we live fully devoted to him. When we live fully devoted, not lukewarm devoted, not sometimes devoted, not if I got enough of my Christian friends around me and then I'm going to be bold. Can you be bold being a remnant? Can you believe you're the only Christian left and still be bold to his truth? Elijah was, and he wasn't the only one left. See, we are called to not be friends of this world. So why are we? Look at James 4, 3 and 4. And I love this. James is Jesus' brother. Okay, he knew Jesus. Knew his mother. Knew his father. Earthly father. See, and he struggled, him and his brothers, with Jesus. And then... As Jesus dies and resurrects, now there's a whole new power in him to share. And he goes in James 4, 3 and 4, he says, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what gives you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be friends of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. That is the word of God. See, don't fit into the world. It's only going to lead you astray. Nothing the world can give you is going to be better than what God will give you in here. And in here, with the Holy Spirit living in you, because the Holy Spirit will only give you what's in here. 
See, there's no contradiction. There's no change. There's no, man, I read this, and I, God told me this, but the Holy Spirit said, I should do this. Never. He only tells you what Jesus has set up, that he has gotten from God, that we can get together. See, we can stay strong because he makes us strong. And he will use every single one of us that fear him with that reverence to live for him. See, irreverent fear draws us to God. See, when we're afraid of him, it drives us away. We have to get the difference. Because we hear fear and, oh, we got to fear. No, it's a reverence to understand how good he is. And man, he gave us it all. I want to draw close to that. When you fear something that you're afraid of, you run from it. That's not our God. He wants you to draw close. See, Elijah, after nothing happens, he builds an altar with 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he digs a trench around the whole thing to hold water. Then he throws wood on it and pieces of the bull. And then he tells them to pour water on it three times. There's so much water on it, it fills the trench. See, he starts adding extra things because their God couldn't handle the regular thing. And then in 1 Kings 18, 36, we see it. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. See, Elijah, again, remember, he thinks he's the only prophet left. And he's still worshiping the Lord. Prove that I'm serving you. Prove that this is you doing this, not me. We may be in the minority, but we are mighty when we understand that we're his servant. And we live our life to serve him. And we desire to do that fully. See, we're all in. See, we're holding the line. We are doing things with unwavering faith because we're full. See, that's our mission this year. Hold the line. Have that unwavering faith. Unwavering faith. That's in bad times and good times. See, fully means fully. It means with prayer. I love it. Tuesday night, we have prayer and worship to our God that is the mightiest, the all everything created heaven and earth. And we have a Lord that came in flesh that is God that said, I am the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We get to come Tuesday extra to say thank you and worship and praise. See, Elijah prayed for God to do. We pray as well. And we worship him in spirit and truth. That's so important for us to understand. Look at John 4, 24. It says, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. See, you can't worship in spirit only. He has a truth. His truth is real. No matter what we want to say, his truth is real. He set it up. We learned last week with Noah, why did he have a husband and a wife on the boat? Why did he have, make sure you bring male and female? He set it up so we can make life happen. That's why our God is perfect. You have to understand spirit and truth. It's not just truth, it's not just spirit, it's not just love, it's love and truth and spirit and everything that comes together with who God is. Look at what James says in 5, 16 and 18. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
We're a place to call home. Tuesday, come pray with each other. I don't think there's Tuesday night football. There will be soon, but not yet. See, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the skies sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crop. Man, that's understanding who you serve. Don't start anything without prayer. See, the relationships we build will be priceless if we start letting go and start seeking him. It can turn if we forget for a moment. See, when we forget to pray and we start living life again and we got, get lax and we're comfortable and we start doing our prayer and devotion time get less and less, we get caught up in the world. Look at 1 Kings 19, 1 and 2. It says, when Ahab got home, he was so angry because Elisha not only did that and God took the sacrifice up, he killed 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. He killed all the prophets they were pro that had for those gods, those false gods. And he says, Elijah, he was angry at what Elijah has done. And he told Jezebel, including the way he killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you as you killed them. See, he just saw and did great things. And then Jezebel sends a letter saying that the God that did nothing is going to kill you or I'm going to have you killed because I'm praying to him and he runs and flees. See, Elijah acted like the world. Not someone who just showed boldness and courage. Verse 3 goes on to say, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba in the town of Judah, and he left his servants there and went off by himself. See, Elijah knew Baal wasn't a god. He knew he could do nothing, but he got caught up in it again because he let this woman, this Jezebel, share that he, she was going to have him killed. See, we get tired when we think we're alone. I want you to understand, he thought he was the only one. And he thought he was alone. And I love it because God tells him, you're not alone. There's 7,000 others that have never bowed down to Baal. You're not alone. Look around. Don't let the world get you. Because the more you do it alone, the harder it is. Because you're going to start believing the things people lay and start telling you and start sharing with you. You're going to start believing them. And you're going to start getting yourself farther and farther away from who is the one. So I want you to think of this as your take home today. Number one, we are never closer to defeat than in our own and our moments of greatest victory. I know that's tough. And I, I saw it, and I loved it, and I'm studying it. What the heck does that really mean? But we are never closer to defeat than in our moments of greatest victory. They have two quote. This is quoted by two people, and here's what it really means. It means that when we feel like we have won and are invincible, we may let our guard down and become vulnerable to defeat. It's a reminder to stay vigilant even when things are going well. See, he should have been at the top of his game. He just killed all these prophets, and God just showed everyone in Israel who God was. And in that victory, who knows? He gets comfortable, and he gets afraid. See, we fight, and we dive in, and we learn, and we grow, and we let God lead us. And man... Those moments of greatest victory are there because we step through them. 
but the feet is right there because if we let go, and we're easily taken up by this world. Number two, we never are as alone as we may feel. God is always with us. I want to share this. It won't be in there. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, and I love this. It says, then if my people who called are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. How cool is that? Even when we mess up and we act like ourselves and we get caught up and like Elijah, he did all this stuff. God, I'm your servant. I'm going to do this. And all of a sudden I get this letter. Oh, now fear sets in. He goes off and hides and God shares with him. See, when we turn to him and repent, he's right there. And pray every day that this world will stop the madness and that we as believers will step up and we'll start being bold and we'll start pushing back to the lies of this world and we'll start living with more people coming on together to start making a difference. You're never alone. You always have God, but you always have people around you. If you continue to accept people and let them be relational with you and give them your time and give them um, and, and work together to learn and grow. That's why groups are so important to us. And number three, God speaks more frequently in persistent whispers than in shouts. What's that mean? We have to be seeking and praying and talking and listening. He's not going to shout at us all the time. Hey, Keith, wake up going to be, if you come to me and you seek me and you ask, you will find. Just keep connecting with him. See, be strengthened by the word and hear the whispers by letting the spirit lead you. Let's pray. Dear God, we come here and we thank you for your love. We ask you to fill us and help us to understand that you are always here. You will never change. And you want us to just let go and just serve you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for counting us worthy when we are not. But you that's how much you loved us. Help us to be a light. Help us to shine. Help us to make disciples. Because people should know what we know because it is the true way to have peace and joy and make a difference. Keep us away from this world. Keep us distant from the evils that this world is trying to bring in. Don't let us be comfortable accepting and glorifying sin. Help us have that reverent fear that we want to hate what you hate and love what you love. And that we can live the way you want us to because you've given us the spirit in us. We thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.